Today we're going to talk about the fine structure constant. Yes, we are. Traditionally, this is a baffling term. You could be daunted because, of course, there's going to be a huge amount of confusion. Now, my job is to cut through the red tape, uncover the actual meaning. What? What is it? Well, it's part of the quantum paradox, so it's very difficult to talk about. That's why it's daunting. I'm here to dispel all of your confusion, fear, anything, so that you and I together will learn about this constant so that we actually can say something intelligent. It doesn't mean that you're figuring out the quantum paradox. It is strange to assert, to experience this. Everyone who talks about the quantum paradox stutters. You see, all of them do it. They, you just lose your ability to think without jumping in quantum jumps. <laughs> kind of an existential. We're going to look at Lori Gardy about 30 seconds to see what she says. Let's see if she stutters. Now, this is a constant that uh, historically <laughs> uh, physicists uh, like Richard Feynman have laid awake at night and uh, wondered about and pondered about what is this, uh, this alpha. They use the Greek character alpha to, um, to depict this constant. And so today what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do a little bit of decoding. I'm going to decode the fine structure constant. Now, why am I doing this when, you know, historically others have done this and maybe it's already done. Maybe everyone already knows what alpha is, but um, that's not how I roll. That's not how I work. And Okay, I think you got the idea. Lori Gardy is extremely high on my list of astute scientists. It's just, I guess, a little trick of nature. <clears throat> and before, before talking about Lori, whom I actually admire, I really think she's top-notch, but she is just extraordinarily tedious. She calls herself Fractal Woman, and it's kind of an angelic, beautiful girl who's fractal woman. I had to force myself to listen to her videos on the fine structure constant and other aspects of quantum mechanics. She's the only source who has reliable information on the fundamental constants of nature. You're not going to even get that from Unziker, who's made it his life study to get to the bottom of the fundamental constants of nature as cataloged by science. Even he is not fully reliable because it's somewhat baffling, especially the fine structure constant, about which Unsicker knows practically nothing. But Lori can define it. I've never heard anyone else define the fine structure constant. Now she's also going to be talking about the anomalous magnetic moment which is all Paul Dirac thought about in the last 10 years of his life. That's all he did. He said so. And he would not talk to any other scientist. Very rarely. He was already known as a taciturn scientist, actually kind of withdrawn. He was a normal man, but he did not have a normal childhood. You can always trace back the strange behavior of someone who's otherwise normal. You'll always, every single time, Trace it back to a childhood trauma. It's always the father. It's always the father. The only time it's not the father is indirectly due to the father's influence on the child. Otherwise, it took place at school, which is a hideous prison system, let's face it. So, communism basically accounts for whatever daddy does not account for but that's why Paul Dirac was very reserved. But he, <laughs> he was reserved for a reason which made sense to him as a scientist. He's thinking. And in the last decade, that's just rounding it off, just the last years of his life, he didn't do anything except think about the anomalous magnetic moment. And he wouldn't talk to anybody who was not thinking about it at the same level as he was. Which meant that he lived alone and was friendless. 
unbelievable, and he suffered from a stomach condition due to his father's abysmal treatment of his son, and it wasn't even cured until Dirac was in his 80s because someone knew that perhaps he needed a certain kind of acidic rebalance, and then I guess in the last couple of years of Dirac's life, he was relieved of a lifelong stomach disorder that was very painful. So he endured that and got to the end, but there's a lot of reasons why he lived alone and just did not enjoy conversation at all. It's because nobody could keep up with him. He's the perfect mad scientist. So to get back on track, he dealt with that number. And he said plainly, that quantum physics is halted and it's not going to resume because, well, he said, unless you can figure out the anomalous magnetic moment, nobody ever has. And then Richard Feynman came along and without telling anyone, or maybe he didn't even know, that when he was talking about the fine structure constant, that he's also talking about the anomalous magnetic moment. They're the same. They're a different dimensionless number, but they're related on a constant number called tau. So the fine structure constant, according to Richard Feynman, was what was holding up science. And he basically, he gave up. Richard attended Esalen and he hung out with a lot of homosexual hippies and he was just a dirtbag. He just smoked cigarettes and drank booze as if he was, you know, leading the youth in the right direction. He was kind of a jackass. And Richard Feynman is no one to admire. He's one of the men who worked on the atomic bomb, so he has no moral compass whatsoever. And yet, you know, he gave those lectures. He was considered to be a suave, you know, talker. Well, that's because he was a mountebank, and he knew it, he said so. He said, don't blame me that the universe can't be understood. Well, that's not a scientist talking, that's a hippie. And he also said that nobody will ever understand the fine structure constant. Well, maybe Paul and he could have talked, apparently they never did. And so Paul died frustrated, and Richard Feynman died drunk. And that's where physics is at today. Nobody's ever done anything since Richard Feynman. You know, you hear stuff, but they have to keep publishing something to justify the trillions of dollars they get from the government. They're on the dole. They're, they're commies. In, in the strict sense of the word, they're under a communist government that communalizes the mathematicians to keep them, you know, from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. 99% are slaves in New York, San Francisco, and everywhere else. And there's 1% mathematicians who work on physics because those are favored by the Godfather because they produce atomic, nuclear, super nuclear weapons. Robots, these robots are to make soldiers. There are dogs that could kill you within three seconds a hundred feet away and you release those on your enemy they're just going to tear through the streets while the drones fly through and then come the robots with the tanks who really don't have to do much you don't want to lose real soldiers so that's all these mathematicians have that's all they know about so they pretend oh we're working on the secrets of the universe oh oh they'll tell you anything anything Lex Friedman gets on these absolute nut jobs. They have PhDs. Well, the government gives them PhDs. They didn't earn that. All they did was what they needed to do to get money. That's not earning. <laughs> that's, that's doing what the government says. They're conscripted. They're conscriptees. So Richard Feynman is nobody's idea of a hero. Paul Dirac, you could say something positive about Paul. But what they agreed on, and this is at the top level of physics, no matter how psychotic these men are, it doesn't 
really, that's just what happened to their minds. But what about science? What's, what's left over? Well, you're going to need Lori Gardy, the fractal woman, to tell you what these, these nerds, I mean, these geeks simply don't know how to communicate. They're math of fucking tessions. <laughs> you understand? They can't communicate. They think in numbers. They're bred to do so. It's, it's the true form of natural selection. It's probably one reason why <laughs> whatever evil conspiracy or Satan or whatever it is controlling the governments, whatever is guiding that immoral death machine, you know, probably teaches the kids that, you know, you're descended from monkeys. That's called natural selection. So the kids and the parents, the society will not realize no, what your kids are undergoing is natural selection. They're breeding mathematicians they have for four to five generations now. They, just being the people who lived before us, just following a natural gradient is quite unnatural. It's very unnatural. That's why physics is just so confused and daunted. It's just, and, and we're still entertained by it because we like whirly gigs and explosions and electromagnetism we're fascinated with it we always have been but nobody knows anything about it nobody's ever been able to describe what magnetism is so to talk about the anomalous magnetic moment you're just going to get gibberish you're going to get alice in wonderland stuff for all kinds of reasons they don't know what they're talking about they wouldn't be able to communicate it even if they did know what they were talking about and Richard Feynman is no exception, so he just smoked and drank and hung out at Esalen and just behaved like a bozo because he's a very persuasive and, I would say, good teacher. I mean, by the current standard, Richard Feynman was top-notch. So he and Dirac agree, if you want to resume science, Richard Feynman said you won't because you'll never understand it. Paul Dirac was fairly certain that someone would have to understand this because otherwise nothing can be understood. It is the quantum paradox. So anyone who could actually define perfectly accurately what the anomalous magnetic moment is or the fine structure constant is would actually understand the quantum paradox and so far I'm the only one who's ever actually penetrated the secret of the quantum. So I'm trying to explain that as I did in my prior lecture and in fact in the past 720 lectures. I've been trying to expose the spherical geometry of the universe so that we can finally understand what 20th century physics actually discovered. I haven't seen it printed or spoken anywhere so it's high time someone said what progress have we made? I began by trying to show the astrophysical objects like galaxies, clusters of galaxies. Most people don't even know that there are clusters of galaxies. It was known when I was in grade school, but nobody ever told me. It wasn't like it was up on all the, the walls at any college or high school. Instead, there's this big funnel showing the Big Bang plasma inverse explosion. Unbelievable, the same as before that or simultaneously with that, this big chart of the dinosaurs and how hens turned into lizards and then lizards turned into dinosaurs and then some of the lizards became pterodactyls, they grew feathers and then they became birds, they just magically learned how to fly because that's what mud does when it starts to think with amino acids. It just grows into birds and fish and reptiles and dinosaurs brontosauruses that produce trillions of tons of petroleum once they're buried by a worldwide flood, which again we were not told. Although, to be, it actually wasn't known when I was in high school. It was only in the 1980s it began to be discovered that Genesis was correct, at least in the sense of the 8th and ninth chapter. I mean, you may not believe the story of the Ark, and I'm not going to tell you my point of view because it would just 
it would just make you cry. You would, you would lose your mind if I told you what I knew about the Bible. You'd end up hating me. You'd end up despising me. It, and I have been attacked physically for my point of view on the Bible because people are traumatized. Remember I told you, if you're traumatized in your youth, which my generation, most of us were traumatized by religion in our youth. Now, I wasn't. So I was free to read the Bible, but no one else was free to read the Bible. The only people who read the Bible in my generation were people who were forced to read the Bible. And then one of two things happened. It's so sordid that I won't go into it. But I was spared that. So I did understand that Louis Alvarez's son, Walter Alvarez, Louis Alvarez is a Nobel Prize laureate in physics. Well, his son discovered the comet that, that wiped out the dinosaurs. So all of this is part of what's left out of your education. Well, you might ask, what did you learn in school? You learned numbers. You were, you were being taught mathematics. Nothing else mattered. Because the government sets up the school system, and then it hires just the right people to control what the government says is going to be the curriculum. It's the government that's teaching your children all about linear algebra. So that is actually the problem, is linear algebra does not work. <laughs> linear algebra is only useful for governments. Governments love linear algebra and they're not going to let it go. That's why my discovery will never be noticed. So if you're noticing it, I appreciate that because I believe in communication. That is science. So to get back to these numbers, that's half of the opinion of the top-notch physicists of the 20th century. One of them is still alive that I cited, Roger Penrose, Sir Roger. He's 93 years old. Now, he has a different point of view. He's, he's not really saying, as Feynman and Dirac did, that you need to understand these constants, these dimensionless constants. And, uh, and Feynman and Dirac, of course, are correct, but from only from one point of view, because this is a kaleidoscopic paradox. Well, you can look at it in any, an infinite number of ways without ever finding the correlating structure. Well, I found it. It's actually quite simple, but that can be baffling when things are so simple because it contradicts what you were taught in school. So that's why I set this up by saying the mathematics that you were taught in school is not correct. You were not taught correctly. You were not taught the operators correctly. And when you finally learned calculus, if you got that far, you were brainwashed because calculus is an illegal operation. Now, of course, it does have a function. Calculus builds freeways. Calculus builds your cars. Calculus builds your spaceships and guides them. So calculus is useful, but it's only useful in a limited reference frame, and Einstein was unable to break out of that. So general relativity is a misnomer, unless you have one further enclosing space, because special relativity is simply limited relativity, but general relativity is supposed to have a general reference frame. It's, it's, it's general with respect to special relativity, but general relativity is not general enough. It's not general. It has a zero reference frame, just as special relativity does. Everything in science has a zero reference frame because you have to have the origin or you can't have a grid. But is the universe actually set up on a zero reference frame? I proved in 2022 that the universe is not set up on a linear reference frame which is synonymous with saying a zero point center is really a zero dimension, a zero dimensioned reference frame. Well, the universe does not accept that. The universe says you are wrong. And then we have to figure out where we went wrong. We went wrong with Euclid's first sentence in elements that a point has no dimension. Now, 
Euclid did not use the word dimension. That's an English word from the future, basically. But that's what he said. In Greek, in his own language, it's very well understood. That's what he said. He didn't begin by talking about a line. He began by talking about what it takes before you can have a line that, that has numeric significance. You start with a zero dimension. And that's why there's a supermassive black hole singularity. That's also why there's a Big Bang Theory. And that's also why we can't penetrate the quantum paradox. Is because we're using a zero reference frame. That's geometry. So Euclid started out by with the stupidest thing he could possibly have done. Except for one magnificent superpositional fact. That that's the only way to get numbers. You actually have to have a zero in order to have a one. But what was never discovered until I discovered it two years ago, really three years ago, is that you can also start a new number system without zero. You can start an entire rational number system equivalent to linear numbers, perfectly the same in, in defining space, except infinitely more powerful and accurate. And nobody ever knew that there was another number system because it's superpositional and therefore makes no linear logical sense. Even though we have complex numbers, which were not easily accepted until it was shown their utility. Just as the calculus is quite daunting and difficult to even grasp or understand, but once you know its utility, you want to know it for its power. Same with complex numbers. What I discovered is you can integrate both complexity, which is really imaginarity, and you can also integrate your one component numbers into two componency, which is complexification, so that the plane is no longer squared. The plane is ringed. It has concentric circles instead of a grid. Instead of squares that go out in four directions, right? squares that go out in four directions. That's correct. They're squares that fill up the plane. Well, that fills up the universe with cubes. And that simply cannot work. It's a zero reference frame. When you get to universal geometry, as we achieved in the 20th century, in both spherical directions, the atom was finally discovered, and so was deep space. That is, beyond our stellar sphere. So having discovered spherical space in both directions, science was unequipped to deal with it, and so it used the two tools that were developed, calculus and the complex numbers. Well, I discovered how to integrate calculus so that you don't need it except in one inverse derivative operation. Because when you step up from linear grid space to spherical ring space, these concentric what are called annular rings, they're spheres. You just think of it as an expanding bubble that generates numbers. So, but it comes from a spherical surface, not a zero D surface. And that surface I proved is the value one. And that is absolutely proved by physics, by Max Planck and Albert Einstein. The discovery of the quantum was the discovery of the innermost sphere in another number system. It's the smallest sphere inside of which is imaginary space. That's the definition, the true definition of the quantum. So I hope I've given you something valuable there. I have proved this as well. It also solves the cosmological problem because since there's an inner sphere, now you have an inner center to a universal space. Well, that means you also have an outer sphere that bounds finite space. And what's beyond that is imaginary again, these are two reciprocal infinities. I proved that in 2023. That that actually defines physics at all levels. That it's spherical, not linear. You can't see it unless you switch number systems. Nobody was able to perceive that there was another number system even after the advent of two component numbers in complexified form. Well, I integrated that complexity. 
That is, the universe did, and I discovered that its number system already has imaginarity built in. So you don't need complex numbers, you don't need to use complex algebra. It's built into the system. You already have the imaginarity you need in universal space. So you don't need to invent it, it's already there. As well as that, a spheric surface defines a two-dimensional universe. It's not 3D or 4D, it's 2D, but not with lines. So it's not two-dimensional linearly. There's a spheric surface, which is one dimension, and the other dimension is the force line. The force line. And Ruger Boschkovich proved that for atomic space. Now in Croatia and Italy and some other places around Europe, it has been discovered by top-notch research physicists that Ruger's two-force system also explains molecular structure. It's not limited to the atom in its explanatory capacity. What I proved is that it also explains gravity and unifies it with electrodynamics 100%. So that's the unified field solution. Now the way I'm showing that to you now is from another kaleidoscopic approach be, to get through to see it from another perspective. Eventually you're going to get this. I try to arrange these presentations so that you have the possibility, the option, if I do my job right, which is hard to do, to show you so that you have a direct perception. So here we're coming at it from the point of view of the AMM and the FSC, which you could abbreviate the rather lengthy <laughs> Anomalous magnetic moment is quite a mouthful. Well, really, so is the fine structure constant. Sorry, I just got a message on my phone. I thought that was turned off. Please turn off your cell phones. Well, the professor should turn off his, too. <laughs> so the fine structure constant is the one that's visible. You can actually see the fine structure constant in a spectrogram. That is, you can see the manifestation of that number those lines were thought to be solid, they're units, but when they're examined closely, a selection of those lines have a split in them. It occurs in the hydrogen spectrum. You have a little tiny dividing line inside of the line, and that's called the fine structure. And the constant that helps us to at least mathematize that is called the fine structure constant. And you can always remember that number. 137 is 1 over 137. And if you punch that into your calculator, you'll get 007. That's a magic number. It is a dimensionless constant. Dimensionless means two things. First, technically it means there are no units. So it's a relator without units. That means it's uh, trans-dimensional. It's relating to domains, and I have to say domain rather than dimension, because dimension is a linear term. This is 1D, the squared plane is 2D, and volume space is cubic 3D, space time. That's cubic space with complexification and all the rest that allows an analysis of the curvature, which is spheric curvature. So there's a shortcut to writing the field equation. And it requires such a mind wrench and a mind split and really a temporary form of psychosis, which you pray will wear off. Because in order to imagine there being a higher order of number space, which is what this is, but it's simpler. It's simpler even though it's, it's better than the linear number system. That contradicts what you were brainwashed with. That contradicts Euclid. It buries Euclid. No, it doesn't. But you think so. So you balk. You can't, you can't face it. It's too much. You can't leave behind your linear number system because everyone knows deep down inside, and correctly so, that only linear numbers are computable. And it's a small set of the linear numbers that are computable. The whole counting numbers are all binary representable, but only a little more than half of the fractions are representable. One over three is the highest number in fractional space on unity anyway, with a one in the numerator. 
1 over 3 cannot be represented on any computer. So it's obvious that another number system must exist. Well, nobody ever even dreamt that for reasons which I hope I've clarified for you. So you know why nobody's ever seen this before. So you won't think that you're crazy or that I'm crazy. We're not crazy. But we're going to believe that we're crazy for a moment. I did. I, I think it's unavoidable. You just think, well, I must be in, in, in Lulu land. No, it's really simple. There are two domains in natural space. The way we geometricize space should not begin with a line. It, it actually makes no sense in the universe. It does for developing the number system. But once you have the linear number system, you can now use those linear numbers, the computable ones. You have to use the computable linear numbers to form what are called proportional numbers. The Greeks only used proportional numbers. They only thought in terms of proportion. We have the proportional number system built into our operator set, but nobody ever saw it. That multiplication and division are clearly a pair of operators that are not addition and subtraction. Well, it can easily be proved, in retrospect, it's easy to prove, that when you start with a line, you're basically developing your concept of linear separation, which we call distance. That's a computable distance. That's the beginning of mathematics, but it's add and subtract. There's no multiplication or division in our concept of distance. So where do we get multiplication and division from? I think you know, but I've t taken great pains in prior presentations to show you exactly the relationship between the additive system and the multiplicative system. The multiplicative system is strangely related to addition. Because we say addition, and by that we mean and subtraction, but technically speaking, you don't need subtraction. You could say there's negative numbers, that's true. You could add the negative quantity and that's equivalent to subtraction. Which is very helpful, so we take it for granted. You can't take it for granted here because those two operators are paired. They're paired on a 180 degree valence. Well, that's not the way the universe works. Well, how does it work? Two perpendicular spheric lines. There are two spheric lines. The sphere itself is a closed line. And the spheric line that comes out from the center, we say in all directions, that's actually one spheric direction, which makes a spheric pressure. If it pulls in, it's gravity. If it pushes out, it's light. And I proved that. It's rather obvious that those are the two balancing forces of the universe. Well, physics is currently unaware of that fact. The mathematics does not support it because electrodynamics is conceived as plus minus. That's actually a mistake. They're not plus minus, they're orthogonal. And here's how. The force field generated by a proton or an electron is a force field. The electron is a force field. And its outer aspect is centrifugal. It's trying to go out and the existence of the photon proves that. Now, a proton contracts space. And these are perpendicular, and it's very interesting to see how they're perpendicular. Because the force line, you can just think of blowing up a balloon with every pump or breath. It's going out. That's centrifugal force. Well, it's also being held in by the rubber surface. And that's basically how you can think of both an electron and a proton, but their geometries are perpendicular to each other, so it's jarring to us because we think it should be plus minus, that the electron is negative with respect to the proton. That is not true. The plus minus system is adapted to linear geometry so that it actually works because you're talking about a flow direction. But the way it actually exists in the atom is not a flow direction. That's only when there's a lot of atoms, so that there's an electronic range 
where you can measure in one direction or another. But James Clerk Maxwell proved that magnetism is conjugal with, with energy. So that as electricity is said to flow in one direction, there's a magnetic dipolar field. Now, gravity is not dipolar, it's monopolar. Is it? No. It's also dipolar at the quantum level. And that's profound. So let's complete our thought here so we can study the fine structure constant to see what it really means. In the atomic system, the simplest is one proton and one electron. That's called hydrogen. And it's the emission spectrum that shows us the spectral lines. To make a long story short, the spectral lines contain a subset of lines that have that anomalous magnetic moment, which separates the line into two parts because there's a gap. You can actually see it in the spectrogram and that's measured as 007 without units. Well, what's it relating? It's relating to orthogonal quantities. It's the force line and the spheric surface. The spheric surface is energy itself. You can think of it as momentum itself. So that's where momentum is. It's manifested by the electron in its relationship to the proton because it's perpendicular to the protonic force field that makes it into its spherical manifestation and that is pure angular momentum. It's non-positional. That's why we have a difficult time localizing it. And locality is a big deal in the quantum paradox discussions. I discovered the secret to that. So now you know what the fine structure constant is geometrically. It's a spheric relationship between two domains. And there's a way to mathematize that easily. You use the proportional number system basically discovered or at least used extensively by the Greeks. What is the proportional number system? It's fractions on unity. That's true proportionality. Two over three is not a number that occurs. It's just not a number. In order for to use fractions, which we call division, it's not division. It's proportionality. And there's only one operation. It's, the, it's called multiplicative space because it has a multiplicative identity of one. So that the number one does not affect division or multiplication. Now, in the use of the two component number system, you have two fractions that multiply to one. These are essentially wavelength and frequency. Where frequency is considered to be, for instance, two over one, that's the smallest frequency. That's been proved. So two is the lowest counting number in spheric space, and one is the identity. That's the surface of the quantum sphere. Actually, it's any sphere. It has a value of one, it's the two components change. And if they change to the extreme limit, it's the multiplication of the smallest number with the largest number that still produces one, which is actually light speed. I know this is a lot. I hope you're enjoying this. Please remember at all times that none of our greatest minds have been able to perceive this simple geometric relationship, which is called orthogonality and mathematically it's called conjugality because wavelength and frequency are invert numbers, they're reciprocal numbers that represent light speed and that's the constancy of light speed because light speed is one. The component numbers change and the lowest frequency, you would have to say the longest wavelength, which is one over two. That's a very interesting number to consider Relative to the 2 over 1, which is frequency, the 1 over 2 becomes paradoxical because you can only measure one of those at a time because you're decomposing light speed. Well, the universe decomposes light speed so that we can see light. That's how we see light, is on the decomposition of free space electromagnetism, so it's captured back into an electronic system which our brains are able to uh, interpret so that we see. That's quite an integrative operation that we seem to see spherically. We do. 
I'll show you how you can turn on that part of your mind so that you see the other aspect of the universe, which has led to some pretty crazy extrapolations, such as the extrapolation of the many worlds. Many worlds, really, all it means is that the universe splits in half. And the reason, the reason it's thought to be many universes is because it's thought to happen on every quantum interaction, that it splits the universe and one part just floats away and we never see it because it never came true. That's almost correct. But of course, it's, if, if it's almost correct, it's psychotic, <laughs> which it is. And so that's fascinating to people because it's exciting because it's psychotic. Well, we'll be back with the actual answer, but I hope you've gained some insight, which you, if you haven't seen it all yet, don't worry, you will. Stay tuned. This is Anna Galactic bringing you the secrets here of the quantum paradox. Keep looking up. We'll be right back. <laughs>